Hey, welcome to News Now on TV360. I'm Thelma Okoro. Walter Onagen has been sworn in as the Chief Justice of Nigeria. He was sworn in by Acting President Oyemi Oshibajo. The ceremony took place on Tuesday inside the council chambers of Asurok Presidential Villa in Abuja. Onagen was confirmed as Chief Justice of Nigeria by the Nigerian Senate on March 1, 2017. He becomes the first Southerner since 1987 and Nigeria's 17th Chief Justice. Nigeria's acting president, Yemi Shibaja, has assured the United Nations Security Council that the government is committed to the protection of human rights. He has also assured the UN team that the federal government would review the rules of engagement by the Nigerian military and across the nation's security system. Oshibajo added that President Muhammad Buhari's social investment programs, which include the conditional cash transfer and the Empower Job program, would cater to the developmental needs of those in the Northeast region. And now, before meeting the Vice President, the UN Security Council had taken a tour of the country's northeast region affected by the Boko Haram insurgency. Speaking to newsmen afterwards, leader of the UN Security Council delegation, Matthew Rycroft, said the solution to the Boko Haram crisis in Nigeria and the Lake Chad Basin is the economic development of the region. He says the council was shocked by the number of people affected by the Boko Haram insurgency and assured that the United Nations is ready to offer assistance to Nigeria. We have been working on this issue in lots of different ways throughout the 11 years. What we have been seeking to do on this occasion uh, is rapidly to shine a spotlight on the growing uh, set of crises that are interrelated here and it's the interconnection between the different strands that makes the, com the, the crisis so complex, so hard to resolve but also so urgent uh, to, 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 to grapple with. Secondly, is enough being done uh, on the humanitarian crisis? Barely enough is being done at the moment. That is why we are here. That is why the Oslo conference was so important and that is why donors will continue to need to step up. But it's not just about the international response, it's also about the national response. And that is why we have been encouraging the government of Nigeria and all of the other three governments that we have visited this week to ensure that they too are stepping up their response individually and collectively. Clearly, as my colleagues from the UK and Senegal have underscored, it is not just the military cooperation amongst the four governments of the Lake Chad Basin or the border cooperation, it is also the strategy not just on disarmament and demobilization, but very importantly, a coordination of strategy and sharing of best practices on de-radicalization and reintegration. And here I want to put a focus on the women, because we do see an alarming increase in the use of women as female suicide bombers. So looking at the recruitment of women by Boko Haram, and then the what can be done in the de-radicalization program specifically to address these concerns, and the reintegration because of course there is stigmatization in the host community so looking at the reintegration and reinsertion of the women and girls who have suffered as victims of having been recruited by Boko Haram and then just underscoring again the importance of the long-term durable economic development economic investment income generating and entrepreneurial skill building programs in these affected areas, not just in northeastern Nigeria, but also in the other three Lake Chad Basin countries. We have a timeline of 18 months to address the serious humanitarian situation in northeast Nigeria. Failure to do so, the situation is going to protract and the impact is going to be heavy on the population that is already affected by this crisis. I repeat, we have a very short window and I call on the global community to come together to support the government of Nigeria. 18 months is so critical in the Nigerian context because mm -hmm. after 18, years, 18 months, the government of Nigeria will be busy with elections. Mm -hmm. And elections will distract focus in addressing this humanitarian crisis. That is why we think it's so critical that the humanitarian crisis should be addressed within 18 months from now. The Nigerian government has formally announced the closure of the Namdi Azikiwe International Airport in Abuja. According to the government, the airport would be shut down from midnight on Wednesday and would remain closed for six weeks. 
However, only one foreign airline has agreed to use the alternative Kaduna International Airport. Minister of State for Aviation Hadi Sirika told journalists that so far only Ethiopian airline had agreed to use the Kaduna Airport. Other foreign airlines have kicked against using the airport, citing security reasons. How much do the construction? The figure I don't have offered, but it's in excess of five billion. The contractor will be paid in excess of five billion naira. In excess of five billion naira, Kaduna will remain a seasonal international airport, and if the need be, it will be upgraded or it will be designated as international airport. Secondly, regarding logistics, we provided for buses, which will be for free for passengers to and from Kaduna. We provided for rail, in case those who want to tra travel by train, and also for free. There's also option for people who are high net worth to pay for helicopter services to bring them in and out of Abuja. We have deployed helicopters to cover the airport itself and some of the flashpoints, you know, between Abuja and Kaduna, the highway there. It's right those areas like Katari, where we have, uh, you know, we have the, you know, we have the provision that uh, we need to make some surveillance there to sort of assess the general environment in that area. That is the bush in those areas. Our helicopters have been deployed for the past one week to be carrying out periodic surveillance of those areas. And like I stated, everything is going on according to plan. In Kaduna, between Rigasa and the airport, we are deploying police patrol units along those roads. In Abuja, between Itu and Kubwa, we are deploying police patrol teams on the highways. Uh, what I will apply the members of the public is to cooperate with all policemen deployed both at the venues of the airports in Abuja and Kaduna and the railway stations along the between Abuja and Kaduna. When an airport is built, there is a maintenance schedule depending on the number of landings that are made. After a particular number of landings, there's what we call surface cleaning, which is done. After additional landing, you now do resurfacing. Then, when it fails completely, you do reconstruction. In the case of Abuja Airport, for 34 years, neither surface cleaning has been done, nor resurfacing, and it has de no, it is deteriorated. So what we are doing is actually reconstruction, and there's no other alternative than to close the runway. Thank you. Nigeria's Minister of State for Aviation has also announced that the country will open up its government-owned airports to private investment. He, however, did not specify when the government airports would be opened to those investments or provide any other details. Sarika says all government-owned airports will be offered to investors who have the finance to put up huge fantastic structures as airports with everything, including hotels. The Nigerian Senate has asked the Nigerian Customs Service to suspend its policy on seizing all vehicles without duty. The Customs had given owners of such vehicles a deadline of April 12th for payment, threatening to prosecute those who do not comply with its directive. But on Tuesday, the Senate directed the Customs to stop its planned action until it appears before its committee. The Nigerian government has advised Nigerians with no compelling or urgent reason to travel to the United States to postpone their travel plans until Washington clarifies its immigration policies. This one follows several incidents in which people with valid visas were denied entry. In a statement, Abike Dabiri Erewa, who is a senior special assistant to the President on Foreign Affairs and Diaspora, says no reasons were given for the cases over recent weeks in which Nigerians with with valid multiple entry U.S. visas were denied entry and sent back to Nigeria. Nigeria is not among a group of Muslim-majority nations from which President Donald Trump wants to suspend travel to the United States on security grounds. 
The Socio-Economic Rights and Accountability Project, SARAP, has urged acting president Yemiyoshi Baju to caution the U.S. over harassment and unfair treatment of Nigerians with valid multiple entry U.S. visas at U.S. airports. This follows complaints by Nigerians with valid U.S. visas being denied entry and sent back to Nigeria at U.S. airports. SARAP Executive Director Adito Kumba Mumuni in a statement urged Osibanjo to stand up to Trump and defend Nigerians' recognized right to freedom of movement. Chief of Army Staff Tukaburotai has told those agitating for an independent state to forget it. Speaking in Abuja after receiving an award conferred on him by a coalition of civil society organizations, he said the army would not condone any act that could lead to the disintegration of the country. The army chief assured that insurgency and terrorism were now at the beginning of their end. The Nigerian army says it has destroyed 80 illegal refineries in creeks in Bielsa, Delta and River states. The raid was conducted through the Operation Delta Safe, an anti-militancy operation in Niger's southern region. It comes as the vice president and acting president of Nigeria, Yemi Shibaja, continues his tour of the nation. He has been holding peace talks in the Niger Delta region to stop attacks on pipelines. Nigerian filmmaker Zura Oduwale is working to show the positive things in Africa so foreign investors can take a fresh look at all 54 countries on the continent. Zura, who is just 14 years old, is also an advocate for girl-child education. She believes rebranding Africa is one way to reduce poverty as the world engages Africa as a business partner. One country she is now focusing on is Kenya. Zuria is starting with one of the best known brands in the country, which is the Kenya Airways. She met and spoke with the company's chief executive officer. They spoke about many issues affecting Kenya Airways and the global aviation industry today. Aviation industry has gone through a lot of changes in the past 10 years, especially with the arrival of many airlines from the Middle East, such as Emirates, Etihad and Qatar. Some of these airlines are being subsidized by their governments. How does Kenya Airways compete in an environment like this? So with difficulty, but I think even with the arrival of uh, other airlines, other carriers into the region, I think there's still a place for airlines like Kenya Airways. The first thing is, right at our core purpose is the sustainable development of Africa. Okay. So for us, our footprint in Africa is our strength. 60% of our revenues are derived from Africa. We connect to places in Africa other people do not go to. So that's important. And I think the, the part for us of making sure that we really create the connectivity within Africa, intra-Africa connectivity, is our differentiation. Clearly, competing at an international level is a little more difficult because right then you're going head on with the other players but there's still some niches that we can operate positively uh, against them many economists have said that in the last couple of years kenya's tourism industry has slowly declined now they are saying that kenya's tourism industry is slowly rebounding as someone who works in the tourism industry are these statements true and how has kenya airways dealt with these changes so absolutely, it's a, it's a fact. If I look at the last high in Kenya for tourism, according to industry statistics, was 2011. Oh. And we've seen a decline in those years. Uh, there have been a myriad of reasons, which some include the terrorism threats in the region and, and all that. And so factually, we have lost ground as Kenya. We see it very directly as an airline. If I give you an example, year on year over the last two years, we've seen traffic on, say, a key flow, London to Mombasa, down 40% year on year. So that's big. Yes. So I see a beginning of a rebuilding. I see that rebuilding because the government has worked hard on security, and we see that as a positive impact. I think the slowing down of some of the difficulties out of Somalia also improves uh, the situation. We begin to see some governments withdrawing their travel advisories on Kenya, so that begins to attract traffic. But the challenge is that that does not come in 
you know, automatically it takes time to build. But I think we are in a positive Hello? Yeah, I found your wallet in front of a supermarket. Meet me at Apple Junction. Yes, I'll be waiting for you. Now you find out. <laughs> Two of us. <laughs> Thank you very much, officer. You know, it's surprising that men like you still exist in the police force. Yes, so... Oh, yes. This is just a token <laughs> of my appreciation. Oh, no. You don't need to do this. We're only doing our job. Oh. <laughs> Thank you very much. God You're bless welcome. you. You're now I know police is really my friend. Yes. Friend. Hey. I, I, okay, with this one. I don't understand. You know your problem. You are greedy. I'm a policeman who is doing his job. All forms of corruption in the force. Not in my country. Corruption not in my country. Welcome back to News Now. Up next, we have Business Stories. Fidelia is standing by. Thank you, Thelma. The Nigerian Communications Commission, NCC, has queried top network providers, including MTN, Airtel, and Etisalat, over the declining quality of services provided to customers. The NCC, during an interactive session with the operators in Abuja, also appealed to the Central Bank of Nigeria, CBN, to make Forex available for the operators to address the issue of network failure. Vice Chairman of the Commission, Umar Dambata, also asked the operators to come up with suggestions to address the situation. The Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, OPEC, says the historic oil deal sealed in December is yielding more results than expected. In its first bulletin for 2017, OPEC said 24 countries have joined in turning a new page in the oil history of the world. The Vienna-based oil cartel also said some countries party to the deal are quoting production levels below the point agreed at the December accord. Meanwhile, oil prices were little changed for a third session on Tuesday, with investors searching for directions as concerns over rising U.S. shale outputs. Brent crude was down $0.09 cent at $55.92 a barrel, while U.S. crude eased $0.06 cents to $53.14 a barrel. Concerns over rising U.S. shale oil output have been offsetting the impact of production cuts agreed by OPEC and some non-OPEC members to curb a global crude oversupply. Russia and Iraq have, however, said it's too late to discuss if the pact by OPEC and non-OPEC members should be extended beyond May 2017. Well, that's all on business. More stories coming up. Don't go away. Mr. Job! Mr. Job! Ah, ah, ah. What, what is it now? What well, is it now? Please, t turn down your, the volume of your music. It's too loud. And how is that your business? It is disturbing me. I can't sleep. And the same way you are disturbing my right to good music and where I enjoy it. Eh? What's wrong with you? Is there another person complaining? Uh, maybe we thought that uh, you have lost your mind. Pretty. Are you having a party? I'm just respecting you, sir. Remember, I've heard my husband too. He will not understand why we are complaining because you do not care about other people except yourself. Look, the transformation we need in this country begins in this compound. Yes, now. From you, you and I. This, your selfishness is an offshoot of corruption. Uh -huh. And corruption, not, not in, in my, my country. Oh, you know, eh? Can go, go to your bank. Go. Corruption, not in my country. Welcome back. The United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres has arrived in Somalia on an emergency visit to drum up support for an effort to avert a famine that could affect 6.2 million people. According to the World Health Organization, more than 
363,000 people are acutely malnourished, especially children, and 70,000 of them are severely malnourished and are in need of urgent life-saving support. It is one of the three countries along with Yemen and Nigeria that aid agencies say are on the verge of famine. Just last week, the government declared a national disaster as the drought continued to ravage the country. A South Sudanese army general who quit his position last month says he has formed a new anti-government rebel group underscoring mountain as resistance to the rule of incumbent President Salva Kiir. Lieutenant General Thermos Krilo Swaka, formerly deputy head of logistics, resigned after he was accused or accused Kiir of turning the country's military into a tribal army. In a statement issued, Swaka says his new rebel group, which is the National Salvation Front, is aimed at toppling Kerr from power. The league management company has assured that it will do all it can to assist ailing coach Kilechi Emetuele. Chairman of the LMC Shehu Diko says the attention of the league management company has been drawn to the situation. Diko says that the LMC would partner with his former clubs to discuss ways to make funds available to treat him. The English Football Association has charged Manchester United striker Zlatan Ibrahimovic with violent conduct. Minks has also been charged by the FA for an alleged stamp on Ibrahimovic. Ibrahimovic now faces a likely three-match ban while Minks could get an extended ban for his offence. Both players have until 6 p.m. on Tuesday to appeal the charges. British boxer Tyson Fury says he will return to the ring in May after 18 months. He, he won the world heavyweight title with a points victory over Vladimir Klitschko. The 28-year-old has not fought since ending Klitschko's decade-long dominance of the heavyweight division, twice dropping out of rematches last year before voluntarily vacating his belts. But he said on Twitter he could fight on May 13th with an opponent yet to be determined. That's all we have on news now. Thank you very much for watching. I'm Thelma Okuru.